There we go. Yeah, I told you it was a good question. What would it look like if we started over? Uh, I've, I've always loved this question and questions like it, especially because they force us to free our mind a little bit. Think about it. What would it look like if we just started over? And I think it's a good question, not just personally, because I like to ask it if I just started over my relationship with my little brother, with my dad, with my mom, with my best friend. You should ask it about your friends, your family. Starting over is a powerful thing because it almost deconstructs the preconceptions in that little jail cell of our own mind that sometimes we have a tendency to build and build and build and build. And it gets to be a really powerful question when you ask it, not just about your own life, but about life generally. What would it look like we started over and 67 million kids weren't living under cardboard boxes every day? What would it look like we started over and we created some sort of world where a billion people aren't going to bed hungry every single day or two and a half billion people actually have refrigerators every day? What would the world look like if we started over? Would we really have a world where 30,000 kids every single day are dying of TB or malaria or conditions related to having dirty ass water? What would it look like if we just started over? Because I think what I realized, and I love being here on this university campus, is most of the things that people have told us, most of them are entirely BS. Most of them are just based upon people thinking things that aren't any smarter than you, aren't any smarter than me, but we go on and do it, uh, instead of really having the courage to do something a little bit different. And we decided at Hampton Creek, the company I found a little bit uh, over three years ago, to ask this question about one of the systems that we think is a little bit screwed up. Not education, not healthcare, not policy, all screwed up systems too, but food. Uh, and we started asking the question with a person who's pretty close to me, my own dad. See, I was raised in Alabama on a steady diet of shitty food. We used to eat at the Waffle House all the time. And if any of you folks ever, ever ate at the Waffle House all the time, you know the grits, when you get them in the morning, have like a little thing of butter that's kind of just living at the top of them. Uh, and I used to live on chicken wings and more butter and more butter and collard greens, which was the, always the healthiest thing, except they were still bathed in grease. Uh, and when you step back, you realize that this system of food is really backwards in a lot of profound ways. And, and I start with my dad, and I call this the dad choice, because my dad is a good dude. He's not a bad person. He's not a person who is trying to purposely screw up his body or screw up the planet. Um, and my dad is much like some of the biggest companies in the world, the big companies like Walmart and companies like Target, maybe like you, maybe like your parents. And unfortunately, we've created a system of food that makes it ridiculously easy to do the screwed up thing, right? All that food flowing there that is really cheap, that is really delicious, happens to be really degrading to you, to your family, to the world. Degrading in the sense that it's fueling type 2 diabetes, it's fueling obesity, really degrading to the planet, carbon emissions, too much land, too much water, yada yada. But it's systemic. It's systemic in the same way that bad energy is systemic. I'm not really sure how we're energizing this place, but I can tell you in my own headquarters, for a group of people that really believe in the science of climate change, when we walk in the morning and we flip a switch, a coal-fired energy plant is powering our headquarters. Think about it. Even though we all believe in the science of climate change, we all believe in clean energy is the right thing, but we flip that damn switch because that damn switch is easy to flip. It's cheap to flip. It was just on the wall and we didn't have to do anything. And maybe it's too hard, whatever the excuses we create in our own mind. But the reality is, it is that way. And good people are doing the wrong thing, not because they don't care, but because often the bad thing is the easy thing. And think about that and how it applies to food and how it applies to someone like my dad. My dad, as much as I want him to give a damn about things, as much as I want him to care about his body, as much as I want him to recognize that my family has a history of heart disease, as much as I want him to recognize that we're screwing up the environment, he does not want to eat better food because he thinks better food is too expensive, and he thinks better food tastes like shit. So therefore, he's not going to do it. No matter how many people lecture him, no matter how many people tell him that this is the way, he doesn't care, he's not gonna do it. So I got really frustrated by this, right? It's a system thing. 
How do we create a different world if we're really serious about starting over? First, to really impact someone like my dad, and maybe next, to, to impact things in a bit more of a profound way. And when you step back and you really think about starting over, this is our concept. It's that the good thing, the thing that might be a little bit better for your body, the thing that might be a little bit better for the world, less land, less water, that good thing would be so much fundamentally better than the bad thing that even if you didn't give a damn, just like my dad, you still would do it. And you would do it because it tastes better. You would do it because it's a lot more affordable. You would do it because it just works better for your life in the same way that even if you didn't give a damn about horses and horse abuse back in the day, you still would get in a car, not because you cared about the horse. The car just worked better for your life. So when we think about starting over in food, this is what we think of. We think about a world in which the good thing is so obscenely better than the not so good thing, even if you don't give a damn, you still run towards it. Whether that's an aisle seven in Walmart, whether that's in your university cafe, whether that's a muffin you have in some random hospital that you unfortunately have to stay in three years from now. That's a different way of looking at it. Now, that's a slide, and that's not action. Uh, and along the way, we've been lucky enough to have been recognized for our approach, which I'll get into. We were named the second most innovative company uh, in food by Fast Company. Uh, we were lucky enough to have been named one of Time's uh, new discoveries uh, of last year. And we even had the chance to spend time with some pretty incredible people. The guy on the top is uh, the wealthiest person in Asia, Li Kai-shing. The guy on the bottom, Bill Gates, who named us one of three companies shaping the future of food. Um, these folks around the company have become psyched, become excited by a new way of doing things. Because they realize the way, you can, the way you make good things happen is not preaching about doing the good thing. Because the truth is, guys, I'm telling you, not enough people are listening. And unfortunately, I don't think enough people care, especially when it's too damn hard. So we realized in order to make that third path happen, remember the third path being the good thing only wins when the good thing is better, we had to do something radically different. We had to eject the 1971 supply chain that's just based out of corn and soy out of our head. We had to forget about the stupid ass rules that people tell us about the kind of company that we should create. And we had to say, man, if we started over, what the hell would we do if we were really serious about that? And this is our path. There are 400,000 plant species around the world, 400,000. And 92% of them haven't been explored for how they can make your food better. Why? Well, because habit, because of a system, because we got so addicted to corn and soy and we forgot that, man, there are navy beans and Canadian yellow peas and sorghum and all sorts of plants that grow not just in the Midwest or in Canada, but in West Africa and South Africa, all across Indonesia that if we just tap into them, well, maybe they could actually make food better. Maybe they could help unlock this dad problem that infects my own life and we could do something a little bit different. And I'm gonna take you inside the science a little bit. And I wish my team of, of biochemists and computational biologists and data scientists and food scientists and amazing chefs uh, were here to share it with me, but I'll try to do whatever I can in their stead. So, Take one of the species of plants out there. This is the Canadian yellow pea. The Canadian yellow pea is one of 400,000 plant species. Just one. But the cool thing about the Canadian yellow pea is the Canadian yellow pea isn't just the Canadian yellow pea. The Canadian yellow pea is made up of a lot of different subtypes. I call them cultivars. And each of these cultivars of a Canadian yellow pea, surprisingly, surprisingly, are radically different in their molecular properties. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I was a, a flame out as a football player in a little bit, but I learned this through digging in. So one species, lots of different subtypes. And what's cool about all these subtypes is they're subtypes because different soil, different geography, farmers just grow them differently. And these different molecular properties that these different subtypes have mean that the abundance and the complexity of the world out there is 10x what we think it is, maybe even 1,000x what we think it is, but our minds, again, got so addicted to corn and so addicted to soy, we forgot to dig in. 
So we started digging in and seeing what's really going on with all these plant species. And it turns out that some of them, particularly one cultivar of the Canadian yellow pea, can do some really interesting things. And it turns out one of the molecular properties of the Canadian yellow pea, surface protein hydrophobicity, took me like six months to be able to pronounce that correctly, when it's over a particular threshold, actually does something really interesting in food. It emulsifies. And if you think about why food is food and why it's good and why it sucks and why it's expensive and all that stuff, food in a lot of ways is made up of all these different functionalities. The functionality could be how the flavor is released. The functionality could be uh, is it aerating? Is it rising when you put it in the oven? A functionality could be, is it being preserved? A functionality could be, is it browning? A functionality could be, is it freezing? A functionality could be, is it gelling? And all these functionalities in a lot of way hold the key to maybe making food a little bit better. Maybe making food not so shitty. Maybe making food not so Waffle House style, right? And it turns out for the Canadian yellow pea, this particular cultivar, that we identified one of them that does some really cool things for one particular food product. And this is kind of funny, because this is not actually changing the world when I'm going to tell you this, but it is one. Mayonnaise. Now, mayonnaise is just one of the many food products in the world, right? But it's interesting when you think about mayo, because it gives you this thought, well, what the hell would we do if we started over in mayo? I don't know. What would we do if we started over in cookies? What would we do if we started over in pasta? You could ask that question 10,000 times for lots of different food products. And it turns out that we were able to identify this one cultivar that when it applies to mayo, we can make mayonnaise that uses less water and uses less land and doesn't have any cholesterol and uses a lot less sodium and is a lot more affordable. Now, what does it look like if you do that 100,000 more times. Well, it gets really exciting. It gets even really exciting when you realize when you got all these data scientists and all these food scientists and all these computational biologists working together, and they have all this data all over the place, man, you can model the heck out of all this data. And when you model the data, you don't have to just go do this and do this and do this and do this. You can find stuff fast. And you can screen through these 4,000 plant species at a rocket, at a rocket pace. And you can identify ones that do things beyond emulsifying. And when you step back, you realize, man, there's a massive opportunity in this crazy, goofy, weird, archaic world of food to do a lot of good, not just with mayo. And I'm going to show you a few things that we've done in our own lab, just playing around, really asking that question. What would it look like if we started over and we recognize that 2.5 billion people live in a state of energy poverty? Remember I mentioned them before, and they don't have refrigerators. What if we created new categories for them? I don't know. Protein snacks. I have no idea if we're going to do this, by the way, but it's interesting. Protein snacks that don't require refrigeration, that are infused with micronutrients, that may me make it a little bit easier for my friends where I formerly lived in Liberia or Lagos, Nigeria, to eat better. What about pasta? What would the world look like if we just made pasta better? if it lasted longer, it used less water, if it used less land, if it used less carbon emissions. Ice cream, and dips, and egg pucks, and custards. And we even found a plant that, no joke, when you throw it in a pan, does this. They're close. No wonder you're so excited. I mean, this is so hard. I mean, this is this is the hardest thing. No doubt. No yeah, doubt. This is definitely the hardest thing. Yeah, you're close. I, I have I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of things in, in my lifetime as a culinarian and in the last 10 years making television. What I've seen today is is earth changing. And man, if you step back and you think, let's just rethink this whole damn thing, you can imagine a whole set of improvements, right? And that little cup could be anything. That could be pasta, that could be yogurt, that could be a custard, that could be mayo, that could be a cookie, that could be categories that we're not even smart enough to think about, but you're jotting down right now. What would it look like if we started over? Now, my second favorite question is this one. What would you attempt if you knew you could not fail? Now, again, I love that I'm speaking to a lot of young people here because I answered this question once in my life, and then I strayed away from it, and then I answered again. But when I was in college, 
um, I was always frustrated by these two different paths, right? Uh, some of my friends pursued what I call the soul-sucking path of doing, you know, work with, uh, they want to be an investment banker, work for a shitty law firm, which I did for a period of time. Uh, and then my other friends wanted to be, uh, they wanted to be impact makers. They wanted, to, they wanted to work with nonprofits. And I always felt kind of split. I felt like, man, I, I don't, I certainly don't want to have a soul-sucking job, although I do want to have a little bit of money, and I don't want to just work for a nonprofit because I don't think it's that impactful. Anyway, all this kind of led me to think that I want to be a professional football player, and I ended up not being good enough to do that. And then I went to Africa and chose the nonprofit route. Uh, and when I was there, it felt good that I was attempting to do something. But what I was attempting to do was, in a lot of ways, not nearly as impactful as people thought. And it's not because I worked with bad organizations. It's not because like, I was doing bad things in Africa. It just, it could have been so much more impactful. The change was too slow. Uh, and I would tell my friends about what I was doing in Liberia or, or Lagos, working with farmers in Kenya or trying to help kids get off the street and into school. And man, they'd be impressed. But I'd go to bed at night kind of ashamed. Because you know what the deal is. Like, you know whether you're having an impact or not. You don't need anyone to tell you about it. Um, and I wouldn't really have an impact that I wanted. So I left and I said, I'm going to answer this question. What would I attempt if I knew I could not fail? And if I knew I could not fail, I would be addicted to real freaking impact. If I knew I could not fail, I would start a company, not a nonprofit, but a company that uses a business model to make it so impossibly hard for the bad thing to win. I would start a company that puts the bad thing away and makes it obscenely easy for good people to do the good thing in this year, not in a future year, not in a hypothetical year, this year this is our impact. Just by selling the current stuff that we have, by building a powerful, profound company. This is the impact in terms of water saved, over a billion gallons of water saved, of emissions taken out of the atmosphere, of land preserved. And when I started the company, I got a lot of advice about the kind of company we should be. And remember all those rules that people tell you? Well, people told me when I started Hampton Creek that I should really focus just on Whole Foods. You know, We should really focus on those natural grocery stores around the way that we shouldn't get into places like the Dollar Tree. We shouldn't get into places like Walmart. We shouldn't get into hospitals you never heard of in Georgia. And it never felt authentic to me. And we decided to run really, really fast everywhere. We decided that impact means everywhere, not just for people uh, that could afford it. Uh, and here's a, a quick clip of what that impact looks like just in water. They grin, but they don't mean it. They sing, but they don't feel it. They come, but they don't see it. They can call, but they can't eat it. Think, but they don't speak it. There's a beast eating every bit of beauty, and they all feed it. Stop, moment, try to freeze it. They find it, they don't seek it. At the bar, but they can't meet it. It's gone before you see it. We all dare to repeat it. There's a beast eating every bit of beauty, and yes, we all feed it. I love that song. And we thought, if we were really serious about answering the question, what would you attempt if you knew you could not fail, when one of the largest companies in the world, Unilever, decided, somewhat surprisingly, to launch a lawsuit against my 53-person strong company, <laughs> we said, forget you, Unilever. We're not, we're not going to back down to it, that we're going to stand up. And hundreds of thousands of people signed a petition saying, why don't you drop the lawsuit? Um, and tens of thousands of people called their headquarters in New Jersey uh, and in the UK and said, why don't you back away from messing with Hampton Creek? And for about 37 days, their Facebook account was frozen because they didn't want to post anything because people that believed in the mission and the deeper why of what we were doing said, maybe this isn't the right thing. And eventually, Unilever's own CEO, Paul Pullman, who, God bless his heart, actually does care about sustainability, actually does care about making things better, got involved in it, and they pulled the lawsuit away. What would you attempt if you knew you could not fail? I think if we knew we could not fail, we'd also be not, not afraid to tell compelling stories about what we're doing, not afraid to say, this is who we are, this is our agenda, and this is what we stand for.
you know, when you talk about food with regular people, you could be talking about food with billionaires. You could be talking about food with a homeless person. You could talk, be talking about food with my mom. And man, when you get really into it, all of them think it's crazy. All the energy that we're using, all the nastiness we're putting in our bodies. But the thing is, everyone believes it has to be that way. We've made the bad thing the easy thing. But the way we change it isn't by convincing people to do the right thing. The way we change it is by creating an entirely different system. Because if we think with the same mental model, if we do the same things that created a world of shitty food, we're not gonna create a world of better food. What would it look like if we made it easier for people like my dad and the, the billions of people like him to eat well without even knowing it? Hampton Creek is about a philosophy that believes the only way the good thing wins is when the good thing is so obscenely better than the not so good thing, you cannot help but do it. And that's how we fundamentally change the world. And guys, do me a favor tonight. When you, when you get back to your dorm, when you get back to your apartments, when you get back to, to, to wherever you're staying, you know, remember that you, whether you know it or not, have built a little jail cell in your own mind. I promise you. You've constructed it over years and years and years. It gets a little bit bigger every single day. But you got rare moments in life to tear that mf -er down, right? To tear it down and ask yourself the big questions. What would it look like if you started over? What would it look like if you just ejected the concepts, the habits, all those bullshit rules that people tell you about who you can be, about how fast you can go, about what kind of impact that you can have, and you opened up your eyes again and said, I'm gonna create my life, and my life is gonna be about some impact. Thanks for letting me share that with you.